everyone. Thanks for joining me today. In this video, I'm going to share with you a couple ideas for Valentine's Day. It is quickly approaching and likely this video is only going to come out about two days before Valentine's Day, but I still wanted to share those with you. We're going to be making chocolate chip cookies, which doesn't seem like much, but I have a couple of tips and tricks on how I do my cookies um, to make them super tender and have them last for several days. Also, I um, make toffee and then and I do that a little bit differently as well. And then red velvet cupcakes with cream cheese icing. Those are one of my favorites and they're perfect for Valentine's Day because of the color and the way you can do them. You could take this recipe and turn it into a cake, but I like to do cupcakes because it's actually a lot faster and a lot easier to do. Plus, then I can hand them out to friends and family on Valentine's Day. So I just want to thank you guys for joining me on this journey and let's get cooking. For this chocolate chip cookie dough recipe, I am doubling it for this video. I am doing that because we are taking these cookies with us on the road. Um, by the time you see this video, we have we will already have been to Atlanta and back home again. And so my daughter was having a party with her friends and so wanted to bring along some chocolate chip cookies. And so usually when I'm making it for a large amount of people, or if I wanna put some cookie dough in the freezer so we can just bake off a few at a time when we're having a craving for something sweet, I usually will double the recipe and then put them in the freezer. So for this recipe, it is two cups of butter. Now I will put a single recipe down below so you can see it and then you can adjust accordingly for however many cookies that you need. Um, to the two cups of butter, I am also adding in one and a half cups of sugar and then i'll also be adding in one and a half cups of brown sugar now this recipe was originally the nestle toll house cookie dough recipe on the back of their package i copied down i don't even know how many years ago now probably 20 30 years ago and but since then i have changed the recipe from shortening to butter and when I did that I also increased the amount of flour and so I will go through that with you guys as well but I will make sure to put that down below in the description box when I write out the recipe. Now that my butter and sugars mix together until they're nice and creamy and while it's working on that I'm going to go ahead and get my flour measured out along with um, baking soda, salt, and the other things that I need for this cookie dough. Now that the butter and sugars have been creamed together, and you wanna let this go for a little while to make sure they're blended together really well, I'm adding in four eggs. Now this is the step that I take that's a touch different than the original recipe, and I have just found this through kind of trial and error as I've made the cookies since the age of 12. I've been making, that was actually the first thing I ever made was chocolate chip uh, cookies. And so what I do is, once I start to get the eggs incorporated, I will turn off the mixer, scrape the sides down just to make sure everything is getting mixed well together just because a lot of times you can get the butter and the sugar to stick to the sides. Plus you wanna make sure you get the bottom of the bowl as well because ingredients like to kind of just sit at the bottom and don't always get mixed well together. But what I'll do is I'm also gonna be adding in two teaspoons of vanilla. And when I do that, I let this mix for five minutes on a medium speed. And the reason I do that is it allows it to incorporate a lot more air to the cookie dough. It allows the cookies to become light and tender and also by doing so you'll know that it turns almost white in color it completely changes colors by doing this and I have just found that I, th I don't know if I did it intentionally or on accident one time because I've been doing it for so long I honestly don't remember I have just found though by doing this it just makes for a much better 
cookie. So here comes my vanilla extract. And like I said, I will let this go once this is added for five minutes and just let it mix up. And it really will, it'll change it, the color, it'll lighten it up. It won't be white, white, but it will be a much lighter color by the time that it's done mixing. As you can see now that it has been mixing for a while the color has really changed on the cookie dough so hopefully you can see that in the video but you're looking for almost a light like cream color you just want it to really lighten up and that really will make a huge difference in the texture and the tenderness of this cookie and so i just would highly recommend it um try it and see what you think but this is the way i have been making these chocolate chip cookies for 20 30 years now easily Now that the cookie dough has um, been mixed well with the butter, sugar, vanilla, and eggs, it's time to add in the flour. So to this double recipe, I'm going to be adding in five cups of all-purpose flour. And then I'm also going to be adding in two teaspoons of baking soda two teaspoons of salt. Now, when you do this, you want to make sure that all of your dry ingle ingredients, excuse me, are blended well together, but you don't want to over blend them. And so I typically will give them, once they're mixed together, just a quick little last minute, turn it on really quick and then turn it back off. And then from there, you're going to be adding in the chocolate chips. And I know a lot of people will say to hand stir in the chocolate chips so you don't break any. And here are my thoughts on them. It's a chocolate chip cookie. With that, you can add in whether it's chocolate chips, chocolate chunks. And so if the chocolate chip breaks slightly, I'm okay with that because it's a chocolate chip cookie. And so that would just disperse a little bit more chocolate throughout the cookie. So that choice is yours on how you want to do it. Go ahead and add in your chocolate chips. And then when you do that, you can choose to do it by hand or with your mixer. But honestly, every single time I make them, I dump my chocolate chips in there and I just let the paddle mix it all up. I don't do it by hand.
now that the cookie dough is all mixed together, I'm just going ahead and getting off as much of the cookie dough I, as I can off of the paddle. Now, I will leave some on there because there are a few people in the house that like to have some raw cookie dough. And so now to this, I'm gonna go ahead and get my baking sheet and I'm gonna get them lined. And that's because I have discovered over the last couple years, now anyone who knows me and has had these cookies in the past have always really loved them. They've always been super tender, but they would only be fresh for maybe a day or two, which I'm okay with because it's all real ingredients. There's no preservatives in them to keep them lasting longer. But just through watching something, I'm not even sure what it was, I was just looking at various cookies, recipes, and probably watching something on the Food Network and decided to try scooping out my cookie dough and then freezing it. And just freezing it for even 15, 20 minutes made all the difference in the world of not only having still tender cookies, but they were a bit bigger, thicker, and they were fresher for like two to three days actually more closer to three days which meant we got to enjoy them longer that was the only thing i didn't like while i loved my chocolate chip cookie dough recipe it, it was really really good they just didn't stay fresh for very long and so anytime i made these for friends family events at our church whatever it would be i would always wind up making them the day of just to make sure that they were super fresh so by actually scooping out the dough and then of course I will change the size depending on how many cookies I need to make or what it's for but by freezing the cookie dough allows the cookie to be thicker a touch chewier and to stay fresher longer so I would highly highly recommend that if you have time to definitely freeze your cookie dough but you'll want to make sure you freeze it into already like scooped out shapes don't freeze the whole batch and then try to scoop it out later because it'll be a bit more difficult this is just much easier to do so i'm going to go ahead and get all of the chocolate chip cookie dough scooped out that i want and then from there i'm going to be adding in my valentine's m&ms to make it a valentine's cookie so you can take something super simple like this and just turn it into a valentine's day treat by just adding in some m&ms and so i'm only doing about half and half because my daughter just wanted half chocolate chip and then half chocolate chip m&m for her party that she had with her friends while we were in atlanta Now that I have all of the chocolate chip cookie dough scooped out that I want, I'm just going to scrape the bowl and get everything together. And then I'm going to be adding in about three quarters of the package of M&Ms. It's not a big package. It's just your standard size. And those I do mix in by hand because those are a touch more delicate, in my opinion, than a chocolate chip. And in the past, while I have allowed the the paddle to mix everything up while it was still on the mixer it did break a few of them and then so it seems a little weird that i don't mind it with the chocolate chip but i mind it with the m and m i'm not really sure why i guess it's just one of those little quirks that i have and so um i do this by hand and then from here once they're all mixed in i'm going to scoop them out the same way place them in the freezer and i let them freeze now this time on this day it was for about 30 minutes to an hour but i just want them chilled enough so i can move on to the next step
Now that all my cookie dough is scooped out, I'm gonna go ahead and place it in the freezer. And I believe I placed it in the freezer for about an hour this day just because I had other things going on. I did not cover them because they're not in the freezer long enough to worry about anything getting on them or having any type of freezer burn at all. And then from here, I just count out how many chocolate chip cookie um, dough that I have and then figure out how I wanna get them packaged. What I will do when I'm making cookie dough like this and freezing it is that I put them in a vacuum seal bag because that keeps any freezer burn from developing on the cookie dough which is great which means it'll last longer it'll taste just like I freshly mixed it up and baked them right then and there not I've had in the past done this where I just put them in freezer bags and again by doing so the air still can get to it and you know, you can still get freezer burn on it or you can develop icicles on it and that obviously will impact the taste and the quality of the cookie. And so by putting them in a vacuum seal bag or vacuum bag, um, it really does help keep them fresh. So I just try to figure out the best way to get them to fit in the bag. And then once I have that figured out, I just go ahead and I get all the bags sealed shut. Now I did wanna mention that to bake these, you are going to bake them at 375 degrees. Now, if you do it from a frozen state, it will take them a roughly around 15 to 16 minutes, depending on how crispy you like your cookies. So every oven's different, just please watch them. And then if you do it from a thawed state, it should only take about any eight to 10 minutes, depending again on your oven, but as you can see in just a moment this is the final product my husband likes them a little bit crispier than i do so i try to find a happy medium for the two of us to enjoy the chocolate chip cookies when i bake them and it's just a quick fun little treat to do for valentine's day and kids love them now it's time to move on to the toffee so i like to do a little prep first i have a little more than a half a cup of pecans going onto a pan that i am going to be toasting in the oven at 300 degrees for about five to six minutes i want to do this step first because they need to cool before i finally chop them it's just a lot easier when they're cool and so now that those are going i'm just going to line my sheet pan with some um, parchment paper that my mother-in-law had and i want you always do this step to ensure that the toffee doesn't stick to your pan now i'm going to be lining the pan with raw slivered almonds this was an idea i got from a company in jacksonville called topsy toffee and i never really liked toffee until i had theirs and i think the difference is the slivered almonds having this on the bottom helps the toffee from being too chewy like sometimes you can bite in a toffee and it's just like oh my gosh you can't chew it's too sticky it's making your jaw hurt i really believe that the almonds make all the difference in the world now you can do pecans as well but i really like the almonds now that my my pecans are out of the toaster oven they're cooling i'm gonna go ahead and start on the toffee recipe now this is not my original recipe I left my recipe at home and I did not have a digital copy of it, which is so unusual because I usually do. And I looked high and low to see if I had sent it to anybody and I could not find it. So I found one online that was very, very similar to mine. And so I will link her recipe below, but I will also put mine. The This is basically her recipe is double what mine is. And the only difference is she has corn syrup and salt and less water than I do. So there's a few differences, but this was still really, really good. So you could use either one. Now to your heavy saucepan, you wanna make sure it's a heavy saucepan, one that's nice and thick. You're gonna add in two cups of butter along with two cups of granulated sugar. And with that, you're also gonna add in two tablespoons of corn syrup and a quarter teaspoon of salt and i tell I'll tell you this now because i'm going to give you a little tip as you can watch the video as i'm putting the ingredients in what i discovered from my recipe is i was putting it together one day and realized i had forgot to add the water to it and while the butter and sugar were already boiling i decided to slowly add the water to it by doing so it changed the consistency of the toffee and made it 
I don't know, for some reason tastes so much better because after that I made it again, following the exact recipe by adding the butter, sugar, and water all at the same time. And I didn't like it. I did not like the consistency of it. It just didn't taste the same. So from that little happy accident is how I do it. So I did do that same step with her recipe as well. Um, and so now I will say that if you follow that step, you need to be extremely careful when adding the water because it will splatter. So it has to be done very, very slowly because this is really, really hot when it begins to boil. So I just wanted to give you guys that little side note. That's what I discovered. You can absolutely add them all in at the same time, especially if that makes you a little nervous about having any splatter, but there was just something about that happy accident that really changed the consistency of the toffee that I really like. Now you want to make sure that you have a candy thermometer and if you can have one that attaches to your pan, that's great. If you do just make sure the bottom of your candy thermometer is not touching the bottom of your pan because that temperature and what's in the center of your liquid are going to be different. So you want to make sure that it's up a little bit more. So I have it on a medium low heat to start with to start to get the butter and sugar melted and then I will turn it up just ever so slightly to a medium heat but you want to really watch it and you want to make sure once everything starts melting that you continuously stir this there are times that i still um, kind of scorch the bottom of the pan even though i am constantly stirring so you just want to make sure you're paying really close attention to that as well Now that the butter sugar mixture has begun to boil and looks like this, this is when I start to add in the water and you can see that I am doing it very, very slowly, just a little bit at a time and continuously stirring while I do it. You want to be super, super careful. I cannot stress that enough because adding it too fast and too much, as you can see, see how it's starting to splatter, will cause it to do that. And I don't want to see anybody get burned by adding it in there. So you just need to be careful. Again, if that scares you or concerns you, then just add it in at the beginning. It's just what I have found that I really like for the texture is by adding it at that point and I know how to do it, but I just wanted to make sure I added it um, at a little point fast so you guys could see what I was talking about when it comes to the splatter. Now you can see that it's starting to get thicker and it's starting to change in color. And this is what you're looking for. You are actually going to be cooking this until it reaches 285 degrees. Now her recipe does call for 285 to 290, but I find that it's so quick for the temperature to jump from 285 to 290 that I turn it off immediately at 285 because I still have to move the pan over to where I have the almonds. And so that temperature is going to continue to rise. If it, you let it go beyond 290 or get, it's gonna get harder and it is gonna be more difficult to eat. This is the caramel color that you are looking for as you get close to 285. And again, remember to pull it as soon as it hits 285 because that temperature on the toffee will continue to go up even while in the pan. And now that the toffee has hit 285, 
I've got my almonds ready. This is why I prep ahead of time and get it done so I can move quickly. And then I'm just pouring the toffee over the almonds and you wanna to try to pour it as smooth as you can. You probably will miss some spots because I always do. So I try to keep enough in the pan to come back and kind of fill in those spots that I missed um, with the mixture. It's not something that you can spread real easily. So it's always best to try to get it as you're pouring pouring it because once it hits the almonds it begins to sink through the almonds there's not as much for it to move around and you will see later that it spreads even beyond the almond sometimes but it does coat everything and covers it really well now i will say that you want to the reason why you want to continue to stir and try to keep that going as you can see there was a little spot on my pan that was scorched now thankfully that did not get into the toffee it didn't impact the flavor at all and so what i do as soon as i have the toffee on the the almonds i take my chocolate chips and it's kind of hard to see in the video um but as you can see see how i'm spreading it that it, it spreads but it's not as smooth as it would be if i had poured it over it right away and so i am going to now top top it with chocolate chips and i do that right away because the mixture is so hot that it will melt the chocolate chips and then you're able to spread the chocolate chips or spread the chocolate, I should say, a lot easier um, over the toffee. And one trick I've done with doing that is, now a lot of people will just put the chocolate chips on top and just leave it, but I like to cover it with some foil. And the reason why is it helps to trap in some of that heat, which helps the chocolate chips melt a little bit quicker and faster. Now, had I brought a few more chocolate chips with me, I would have put more on there. So I would say for this size, I probably should have done about two and a half, almost three cups of chocolate chips, but that's really up to you how much you want to put on there. It's just what I would do because it just makes it a touch easier to spread. And now that I've waited about five minutes um, for the chocolate chips to melt, I'm going to go ahead and spread all all that chocolate over um, the toffee and just try to spread it as evenly as I possibly can. And once I do that, um, my father-in-law actually chopped the pecans for me. And so once this was spread out, I am gonna top it with the toasted pecans. And it's just a nice little added extra touch. You don't have to do it. You can stop at the chocolate if you don't like pecans you don't have to add it or you could do some fun things with the toffee by adding you know crushed oreos or make it a rocky road topping you know you can get pretty creative on what you want i just like it just like this i like it with the almonds on the bottom the toffee the melted chocolate chips and then i like it with the toasted pecans crushed up on top. I think it gives it great flavor. It gives it some great texture. It's just, it makes it a little bit different, but you can get super, super creative with it and have fun with it. If you want to top it with M&Ms, top it with M&Ms. You know, you, this is where you can get creative and that's what making toffee is so much fun, especially for Valentine's Day or or even for Christmas if you want to make gifts because you can do it so differently and make it match the holiday. So it's just a really quick, great idea and it makes a ton of toffee. So you can give away quite a few of these as gifts when you make the toffee. Once the toffee is complete and I've got the pecans on top, I put it in the refrigerator and I chill it for a good hour or two just to make sure it's cold all the way through. And then once I'm ready, I just break it up into bite-sized pieces. You know, some are gonna be bigger than others and this is how I serve it. And so I actually put this out for our family get together while we were in Atlanta and everyone really enjoyed it. Um, and I even brought, I left, a some of it there but even brought some home I mean it's really quick and easy for me to make it here but this was just something I wanted to be able to snack on in the car on the way home and so um, but that's it. it is really easy and you can either put this into little like Valentine's cellophane bags this is great to hand out to friends family loved ones um, teachers things like that take it to co-workers but you could also buy little 
decorative boxes and just line it with some wax paper and put the candy in that. You can jazz these up a little bit and hand them out as Valentine's Day gifts or just enjoy them for yourself. You don't have to share if you don't want to. Now to move on to the red velvet cupcakes, you're going to start with a half a cup of butter, which is just one stick. And to that, you're going to be adding in one and a half cups of sugar. And so you're going to go ahead and get that mixed together. Now I will link this recipe below and remember that you can do this as cupcakes or as cake, as a cake, excuse me. And depending on what I am making it for, if it's for a large group of people where it's just a function, I will usually do cupcakes. If it's for somebody's birthday, then I will make it into a cake. And so that option is yours, but this works for either one. Now, one thing I did do that I didn't get on camera for some reason was um, making your sour milk, which is one tablespoon of vinegar plus milk and whole milk is preferred to equal one cup. Now, as you can see, the butter and the sugar are creaming together. And this is what you're looking for when you are making this batter. And so once that's done, I'm adding in two eggs to it as well. And you're going to go ahead and mix that until they're well incorporated. And so along with the vanilla extract. Okay, while that's mixing, we're gonna go ahead and add in our red food coloring to our sour milk. And I do apologize for not getting it on camera. I thought I hit record and I clearly did not. So it, in your measuring cup, you're gonna add one tea, tablespoon of white vinegar, and then you will fill the rest of your measuring cup with whole milk until you reach the one cup mark. And that is making your sour milk. Now the original recipe calls for one full bottle of, re of red food coloring. I don't like to do that personally. It's just a personal preference. I love red velvet with cream cheese, but I don't like my red velvet to be crazy red bright. I just don't like that. So I change that and only do half a bottle Plus it gives me a little bit more um, to use again. So basically I can use one bottle for two recipes of red velvet. And so it's just a personal preference. If you really, really like that bright red, add in the full bottle. It's just not something that I like. I just like more of a, a darker color on my red velvet. Now that my eggs, sugar, and butter have been mixing together. I make sure I scrape down the sides because again, you want to get stuff off of the paddle and the sides and the bottom of your bowl to make sure everything is incorporated really well together.
Now that that's done, I'm gonna go ahead in a separate bowl and add in my dry ingredients. It's gonna be two cups of flour, and then to that, I'm gonna be adding in one third cup of unsweetened cocoa powder, one teaspoon of salt. And so all of this I had pre-measured because again, we were traveling um, up to Atlanta, and so I didn't want to have to buy any ingredients or use up any of my mother-in-law's ingredients um, and so I just brought everything pre-measured um, and made it a lot easier um, for me when it came time to putting it together and so I'm gonna go ahead and get all of this in a bowl and I'm just going to whisk it up you just want to blend it well together and then once that's done you're gonna set it aside until it's time to incorporate into your batter Now that I have my dry ingre ingredients mixed up, I'm going to go ahead and add in the sour milk and the red food coloring. Now the original recipe does say to alternate between the two and the reason they tell you to do that is because it wants you to be able to incorporate more structure into the cake by adding more air into that. I've never had it be an issue by just adding in the sour milk and then adding in the dry ingredients. Now I have had some recipes in the past that I do that with. I will do a little bit of wet, a little bit of dry to build up the structure, but I have never found that to be a problem with this red velvet cake. And I have been making this for many, many years. This recipe came out of the Hershey cookbook. I will make sure it's linked below, but I've never had a problem with that. So I just skipped that step because well, I just do. And so it's never caused an issue. This cake always turns out flavorful, tender. It bakes up really well. It's never been a problem. So I go ahead and add in my dry ingredients, trying not to spill it all over my counter, as you can see. And once I do, I'll just turn it on low and get that mixed up. And, and then to, towards the end, I'll give it one little quick last faster, and then it is ready to go. Now that everything is mixed well and I've scraped down my sides, I'm going to be adding in one and a half teaspoons of baking soda. And then to that, I'm going to be adding in one tablespoon of white vinegar. And the reason you do this, you just put your baking soda on top and pour the vinegar on top and you'll see a reaction. It'll cause the vinegar will cause the baking soda to begin to bubble. And then you'll want to get that mixed in. You do that because it's adding in additional moisture and air to making the cake lighter and more tender when you make your red velvet cake. And I just wanted to be able to show you guys so you can see the reaction that it happens when you add the vinegar onto the baking soda. And once it starts to do that, you just go ahead and mix it in until it's well blended and combined throughout the batter. And then that's it. And you are ready to either pour it into your cake pans or for this video, get it into the cupcake liner so we can bake off some cupcakes. Okay, now that that's going, I've got my oven preheating. We're gonna go ahead and get the cupcake pans lined and then I have my large ice cream scoop. I have found that using an ice cream scoop just makes it so much easier for getting an accurate filling on the cupcakes. Um, I will have to look at the size. Again, this is my mother-in-law's and I think it's a size 16, but I will put it in the video as soon as I find it. Um, on, And it just makes it so much easier to 
fill it just right. So you're not having to scoop in the batter and like pour or guesstimate about are you at the two thirds mark on the cupcake liner. This just makes it so much easier. And then it gives you an even cupcake when it's all baked. And so I'm gonna get these lined and then get these scooped. And as you'll be able to see how much, I, I just fill it to the top and I just kind of scrape it off on the side of the bowl. So that way it's even. And if I get a little too much batter along the sides of the ice cream scoop, I'll just kind of scrape that off and put it back in the bowl. And this made exactly 24 cupcakes. cupcakes are now scooped out and it's time to bake them at 350 degrees for 18 to 22 minutes ovens vary so make sure that you insert a toothpick into the center of a cupcake to make sure they're done I did that at the 18 mark and they weren't done so I believe in my mother-in-law's oven they went for about 22 minutes and so you're just looking for it to be clean when you pull it out and now they are cooling and so it's time to make the cream cheese icing and so with this um, recipe it's one that I have just created myself and so I've had to fine-tune it um, because everybody asked for the recipe and I've really had to try to really cr pay attention to what I do because I really in the beginning just took blocks of cream cheese with some butter whipped them up and then added in the powdered sugar and vanilla until I felt like it's where I wanted so to that to say all that that I am making basically just a half a batch of cream cheese icing if I do this as a cake I will double this cream cheese recipe and so for this one I'm going to be adding in two blocks of cream cheese and then I'm also going to be adding in one stick of butter and so I've also made sure that my cream cheese has sat out for an hour to soften along with the butter it makes it so much easier to getting a smooth cream cheese icing if everything is at room temperature if you do it from a cold state it just it'll stay clumpy you have your cream cheese will still be kind of have little small clumps in it so can the butter and no one wants to bite into that when they're looking for a smooth cream cheese frosting and so I go ahead and let this whip up until it's nice and smooth and then from there I add in the powdered sugar Okay, now that the cream cheese and butter have been mixing for a few minutes, you're gonna see this is the consistency you're looking for. You want it to be really nice and smooth, and you can easily get this by making sure that your cream cheese and your um, butter were at room temperature. And now it's time to add in the powdered sugar. I'm gonna be adding in one cup of powdered sugar and a half a teaspoon of vanilla. Now I have worked really hard at creating a recipe for the cream cheese icing that gives you a good balance between cream cheese flavor and sweetness if you add too much sugar it can make it so sweet that you lose that cream cheese taste however you don't want it to taste like you're 
cream cheese like you've just put onto a bagel and so there really is that delicate balance between the two and I have found that over the years I always just did it by taste but everybody would ask for my recipe and so this is what I've come up with that works and again this is a half recipe so you will double all the ingredients if you're making it for an actual red velvet cake and for 24 cupcakes this is perfect because i have found that people like frosting but not too much frosting and because i'm one who would put a bunch of frosting on a cupcake because i think it makes it look better and of course who doesn't like frosting but i'm finding that people like a happy medium between the two so using just a half a recipe for these cupcakes works just perfectly After adding in the powdered sugar, you will see the icing become even creamier and that is what you're looking for. This will make it really easy to pipe onto the cupcakes or frost a cake. This is why you want to make sure it is smooth. And so now I've got my pastry bag. I had put my coupler and tip on already and I apologize. I thought I had hit record when I did that. Um, to show you guys how I hold a pastry bag, and this is just how I did it in the kitchen when I was a pastry chef so many years ago, I just fold it over and then I take my thumb and my index finger and I stretch them out. And as you can see, I'm fitting the bag onto my hand and that is how you hold it. So that way you get a lot of stability to your bag. It also makes it easy for filling because your hand is underneath the folded bag and your fingers are holding it, you're able to scoop out your frosting, excuse me, and press that against your index finger and your thumb so you can catch the frosting and fill your bag. And again, this is just how I did it when I worked in a kitchen and how I did it when I decorated cakes. And so I just wanted to, you know, quickly show you guys on how you want to hold a pastry bag for filling because I see a lot of people that hold them and just try to dump them in there and it kind of goes all over and so now I'm going to get the cupcakes all set up and lined up I had a little bit of a limited amount of space to work with so I just kind of had to shift and move things around but what you're also going to see is when I do decorative cupcakes like this whether it's for a holiday for a baby shower or whatever the event might be I take a cupcake liner usually I'll bake in a white cupcake liner unfortunately I forgot to bring them with me and just didn't feel like spending the money to do that for this time but then I'll take the decorative ones and then I will place the cupcake inside of that as well and so that way it just makes it look a little bit nicer and more festive for whatever you've got going on whether again it's a holiday or a baby shower and that just helps that liner stick out just a little bit more because a lot of times as you can see when you bake in a decorative cupcake liner that fades you don't see it as well it doesn't stand out as nicely so i'm going to go ahead and get all these cupcakes in the liner and then we're going to move on to putting that wonderful cream cheese icing on top Okay, all of my cupcakes are in their additional liner and as you can see, it just makes it more decorative. So now it's time to move on to icing the cupcake. Now I did write, raise this up a little bit so you guys could see it on camera. Now typically when I pipe out um, my cupcakes, um, I usually have my finger a little bit cl closer to the coupler, but again, I don't have quite the space that I'm used to, and I don't typically raise up my cupcakes when I'm icing, so it's really more of trying to show you guys. You just want to squeeze 
the icing go in a circle and go on the top and they don't have to be perfect that's the beauty of it as you can see i had a pan underneath it when it came time to um, just lift it up so you guys could see it a little bit closer so now i'm going to go ahead and just get the rest of them iced and then i'm going to get them topped with mini chocolate chips that is just something that i like to do when i make it as a cake i will coat the sides of the cake in mini chocolate chips and then pipe on top for whatever the event is that I'm using the cake for and then you can see as I'm piping the cream cheese frosting on here it, I'm not completely covering the top of the cupcake and I'm not putting a ton of cream cheese icing on there and by doing that means the half batch of icing will work and it winds up really truly being just enough and as you can see that one right there looks like a little you know like dollop of cream cheese and that's because I ran out of cream cheese on the bag when that happens I will try to kind of come around it and fill in a little bit more of the icing and the beauty of this is is that you can cover those little if you want to call them mistakes or just little hiccups in your frosting by covering it with chocolate chips and I will just say over the years I have learned that most people are okay with it it's what makes it unique everything is about being rustic now and so for each one to be just a touch different it's okay they don't have to be perfect this is not show perfect these are just really good cupcakes that taste wonderful now I will say that and I intentionally did this so you guys could see it on video when you put more frosting in your bag the best thing to do is to burp the frosting and as you can see that icing just went crazy there's the burp the reason why you want to do that into your bowl is so that way it doesn't splatter all over your cupcake but again these were for family in a video for you all to see so it was okay and as you can as you'll see here soon when i top them with cho mini chocolate chips you don't even notice um, and so it is okay so I just want to encourage you guys if it doesn't quite turn out or if it's not perfect think of it as rustic and that's the best way put a little topping on there and you'll be good to go and I also put on some um, red sprinkles and just to make it again for Valentine's Day So the chocolate chips are just a nice little touch on top of the cup, cupcake. It's just a personal preference for me. However, you do not have to put them on there. You could leave them just as is, or you could top some red sprinkles, or they sell a variety of different toppings for Valentine's Day or for another holiday. If you wanted to do these for Christmas, this is another great one. Really, honestly, any time of the year, red velvet cupcakes are great. It's really up to you how you want to decorate them. This is just how I chose to do it. And again, I only did half of them with a little bit of the red sprinkles on there. Everyone enjoyed them. Um, they were gobbled up. Um, we took a few home with us when we headed out um, to head home. And so we, I, of course, again, my favorite, I enjoy them. So anyways, this is the final product. And I just want to thank each and every one of you who have watched my videos, who have subscribed or liked. I really appreciate each and every one of you. And if you haven't subscribed already, please consider doing so. If nothing else, hit that like button and I will share another video at the end that you guys can check out next. Thanks so much.